Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal. And I am here today with Bruce McCurdy and my cat, who's ruffling around, wrestling around in the closet in the background. How are you doing, Bruce? Oh, I'm doing all right today, today, David. How about yourself? Good. It's very warm in Edmonton, 27 degrees Celsius. Mm. But I got out there and was doing the stairs in the Vet River Valley, so I always like doing that. Alrighty, Bruce, we got some news to talk about. A little bit, yeah. Yesa Puljujarvi signs, and this was, I was not expecting this. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to arbitration. One year contract, $3 million. So the question on everybody's minds is what the heck does this mean? Like, Mm -hmm. what does this mean? Is this a sign and trade? Or does this mean he's going to, you know, they, they want to keep him for this year and they've decided like try him out one more year, see how that goes. Um, first of all, what do you, well, let's, let's start there. Cause it is the starting point. Cause you know, right. you can debate whether this is a good deal or not for the orders, but it's, what, what do you think is going to happen next? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the Jeff Petrie signing in uh, 2014. Uh, the day that you and I drove to Jasper to see the Leon Dreisaitl Darnell Nurse show at the, uh, uh, Billy Moore's Cup, and uh, we got the news on the radio on the way out that uh, Jeff Petrie had signed a one-year deal for $3.1 million, I think it was, and he could have gone to arbitration, and he didn't, but he'd h- held the orders over the the barrel with the arbitration hammer that he could have simply forced a one-year extension and then gone to free agency. And it seemed at that time that they'd already agreed to disagree and they just said, okay, we're, you know, we'll just do the, we weren't not going to put ourselves mm-hmm. or you through that arbitration process. We'll just do the one year extension. that will give you your freedom in a year and we might trade you during the year was, I, I was the undercurrent to that, which is in fact what did happen. And I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here. I'm just saying it reminds me of that situation where you thought these t- two sides are so far apart that arbitration is the only possible outcome. And they just kind of came to this sort of, meeting in the middle of let's get that part out of the way and see what happens next and what happens next could be a trade in the next week month during the season or he could be here for the year and then next year you know we're on a little more solid footing in terms of of coming up with a longer term solution and good thing it was that the Oilers totally screwed it up with Petrie yeah. Because that crooked path led to Connor McDavid. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was a very disappointing contract yeah. negotiation with Petrie, the whole situation. I was a big Petrie fan. Many people were, our, our yeah. numbers, our analysis of him showed him to be a very solid top four right shot D man. And that's what he turned out to be in Montreal. Huge mistake uh, by Craig McTavish's, I think that was McTavish's regime, if I'm not mistaken. He was the GM at the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It could be that, yes. Bruce, that, that they'll keep Puglia Yarvi um, a little ways into the season or for the whole season and see how it goes. I mean, I hope they do that. That's my personal hope because I think he's a top six forward. I think he's a good forward. I don't think you're going to be hard-pressed to find for $3 million on a one-year deal a better player than Yessa Puglia Yarvi. Mm-hmm. I think he's a um, fantastic four-checker. Um <laughs> A great glue player does all a lot of little things that don't go noticed, don't get mentioned in the stats column necessarily, like the boxcar stats. And one of these years, he's going to start to score a bit more. Um, he 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 might suddenly um, either get more a bit more of a power game, or just some more calmness in his game, yeah. or both of those things: more calmness, more power, more smoothness. And I think that the goals will come. He could easily score. He could have easily scored based on the number of grade A shots he had last year, 20 goals. Yes. He could easily score 25 goals in a season. And I think that's going to happen for, for him in his career in the NHL. If I had to say, is Jesse Pugliarvi going to be a bust? So some people think he's going to be a bust. Like, And I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. But when I listen to Mark Spector, I get the clear sense that he thinks Jesse pugliarvi has got a pretty good chances of being a bust. Mm-hmm. That, that it hasn't happened for this player yet. And he's getting older, and it's gonna, not going to happen. So uh, if if Mark doesn't think that, uh, 
th then I take that back. But that's what I think he seems to be saying. Mm -hmm. I don't think that. I oh, think really? I think he's going to be a top six winger in the NHL for about four or five years, and maybe longer. And that he's a good player, and that the orders would be you know wise to keep him. And I'm glad he might be here for another year because I think he could help you beat Colorado in the playoffs, which is going to which is the goal, right? That's climb Mount Avalanche. That's the that's the treacherous path that the Oilers are now on, and I think he could he could help even as bad as he was in the playoffs. Pulley and he was bad. I I I I think that I, I think he was the puck died on his stick, as his critics like to say of him. It really did in the playoffs. He was not playing with confidence. That overlooks all year long. He was making plays, and he just had a bad run of play. So <clears throat> Bruce, they do have to get. I don't think they're going to keep him though. I don't think that's what's going to happen because yeah. I think with the salary cap situation. You know, if you're going to keep, if you're going to have Dylan Holloway or Philip Broberry on the team with their bonuses, and you're going to sign Yamamoto, and you're going to sign McLeod, it's pretty clear they got to move at least one contract more than two and a half million dollars. Oh. So the the I don't think they're going to move Kyler Yamamoto. So I'm going to take him off the list that we'll discuss because I think it's not that's not happening. So it comes down to three contracts. The Oilers mm -hmm. will move one of these contracts in the next month. Mm -hmm. Tyson Berry. Warren Fogel, yes, a RV. Let's go the odds of moving each con each of those contracts. So what would you say? And I'll let you also describe the circumstances you're describing, describing the odds because because, you know, what you'll think you'll get and what the odds are of that particular move happening. Do you want me to start or do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Are, are we talking about what you and I would do or what we think the Oilers are going to do? What the what the odds are the, of the Oilers doing it? Not what we, you're not what you and I are doing. You can say what you would do, but what what you think what the odds are the Oilers will do and what the deal will look like for those particular odds. Okay, go ahead. You go first, and I'll follow your lead. Okay, uh, I'll start with Tyson Berry. Okay. And um, at the start of the year, I I think I predicted that Tyson Berry would be traded, and I based that on I, I really just did not believe Duncan Keith was going to retire. And even the insiders were saying it was like 85-15 or something like that. It didn't sound like it was going to happen. So as long as Duncan Keith um, was an oiler, it seemed to me the Oilers had to move a big contract to sign a goalie and maybe sign Evander Kane, like get in the market for that, for the winger that they needed. Um, so they, they had to move out a defenseman then. Everything changed when Keith got traded. And, and what changed then was that um, the, the Oilers were down one major veteran defenseman who was actually really, really good. I think Duncan Keith is going to be missed more than most people think. He was a really good puck moving defenseman and he was adequate, adequate defensively in a top four role, which isn't always easy to do. Lots of people fail in that role. So he was okay as a defender and he was really good, really good moving the puck. Mm -hmm. So you lose him and you have another player just like that. Really good moving the puck adequate defensively, probably in a top four role. I think that's what Tyson Berry could do this year if asked. I don't think you can lose both of those anymore. You can't have that. So m my feeling is the chances of, the, of them moving Barry, it's, there's still a chance because they got to move somebody. The other thing detracting from the idea that Barry will be moved is, and, and I didn't think this through when I was talking about Barry most likely to be moved is, there was a glut of right shot power play specialist defensemen on the NHL market this summer. And I didn't understand that D'Angelo was going to get traded or, or Brent Burns was going to get traded. But with them and John Klingberg and um, oh, Justin okay. Schultz and um, is there one more guy, one more right shot? You know, well, there was four. You know, usually those players are really hard to come by. If, if there's one you know, on, a, on a trade market who's an obvious trade candidate, that's pretty good. Um, or if there's two, that's a lot. This year, there was, if you include Tyson Bear, there was at least five of this style of player. So it's kind of rare to have that happen. And I think the teams that that needed that player probably have that player. And if they don't, they might be thinking of signing John Klingberg. So there's no, I don't think there's much of a market for Barry either. So the hope that you might get something good in return, you don't actually need anything good in return anymore. You just need to move the contract. I think you could probably move the contract and not get, so my, if, if you were to move Barry, I don't think you'd get much in return, maybe a second or a third round draft pick at most. I'm going to say a, Based on the Bjorkstrand trade where they got a third and a fourth for a top line winger, I'm going to say you get a fourth round draft pick for Tyson Berry and, um, and cap space. And cap space. 
that's what you get. You get cap space. But I, I don't think, I'm going to say that's 2080. Uh, there's 20% chance that's going to happen. 80% chance it would not because of their need for Tyson Berry. No, I wrote a fairly detailed post about the Barry situation uh, last week, and uh, I went through <clears throat> some of the facts that you've just mentioned. Uh, you know, the retirement of Duncan Keith does change the equation, uh, especially on the uh, experience factor on the Edmonton Blue Line. I mean, yeah, their their oldest, most experienced defenseman was Duncan Keith. Their second oldest, second most experienced defenseman was Chris Russell. He's gone, and they have young guys coming up from below which is fine i mean bring on the young guys but uh, uh how many young defensemen is enough and how many is too many when you start you've already got evan bouchard uh old man bouchard mind you uh but you've got uh, philip brober you've got um uh marcus Niemelainen, you've got uh dmitry smorkov uh you've got vincent de harney who's not that young uh, you know, he's a bit more of a long shot at this point. Uh, first of all, all the guys except the Harney that I mentioned are lefties. And <clears throat> the Oilers have exactly three right shot defensemen that played even a minute for them last year. And the three of them, uh, between uh, CC Bouchard and um, Barry, were the top three on the team in games played for defensemen. So they really relied on that trio to, to lock down... Uh, uh, you know, the positions on the right side. So right now, Barry's the, the oldest and the most experienced defenseman they have left in the roster. And to, to also move on to him, unless they're bringing on somebody pretty specifically who at least checks some of those boxes, I'd be, I'd be surprised. I think they, they're given their druthers, I mean, given their druthers, they'd hang on to all these guys and have the salary cap go up to 85 million <clears> or <throat> get the 3.4 million that the CBA said they should have got from the Duncan Keith retirement. But that window is never open and it's certainly closed now, but uh, that would have solved all of this. But uh, I think uh, I, I'm kind of with you on 2080 on, on, uh, on Barry. I think it's unlikely that uh, they move on from him uh, other than, you know, the corner that they're in that may be that whatever opportunity you know some team comes to us and say we don't want warren fogel we need a right shot defenseman what do you what do you want for barry you know that that might spring him free but i i would say it's unlikely all right um yeah they have these young defensemen i, I think breaking in two of them this year mm-hmm. and sixth and seventh as you know your your Three lefty, uh, Philip Brobury or Marcus Niemelainen or Samarukov, and then the other one's your seventh D man, or it's Slater Cuckoo. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, maybe they don't want Slater Cuckoo as a veteran sitting around. Maybe they want another guy, another veteran sitting there. But I think one of them at least makes the team, one of the young guys, and maybe two. I think two is a good idea when you're looking at the six, seven slots on the team. Because mm-hmm. the other, otherwise, the orders are pretty. Evan Bouchard is not a raw rookie anymore, he's been a pro for quite a while now. He's right. the 2018 draft, mm-hmm. and um, you know it's yeah. it's 2022-23 this coming yeah. season. He's a veteran player in the NHL now, and um, so I think two rookies on the team is okay on defense, but three, and then then the whole thing about sliding Broberry over there to play Barry's spot is kind of a sounds like kind of an iffy idea too to me. So let's move on to Yesapuli Yarvi Bruce, or no, let's move on to Fogel. Um, yeah. I'm going to say with Fogel that um, he is, uh, he's the kind of player a lot of teams might like, including the Oilers, if the price is right. Because yeah. he's a big, aggressive winger, skates fast, goes up and down his wing, he's okay defensively, he's got some offense, he's got some physicality, he hustles hard. Um, so he's, he's a solid NHL third or fourth line winger. Mm-hmm. Probably third line. And um, so they're gonna they're they're gonna want that player, but they're gonna want that player. I think at about a million five, or you know two million tops, not two point seven five for two more years. So he's really he's got negative value. Warren Fogel definitely has negative value. So that means what what that means is if you trade him, 
I think it's definite, Bruce. I don't know if you I saw you shake your head there. You, you can. Well, I'm you shaking can. my head in dismay, not in disappointment. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> I I think he's got negative value. You, you're mm -hmm. you're in dismay. You're agreeing with that, and I think it is true. I'm not sure how great that negative value is. I think it might be second or third round pick. Great, unfortunately for those two years. I, I honestly think that because again, looking at the Bjorkstrand, that set the market. That was a real tell on the market, unless Yarmo Kekalainen's an idiot, and I don't believe that he is. Um, he he sussed out the market for for Bjorkstrand, and to, to, they got a top line winger, you know, someone who uh, who attacked and scored like a well, like a at least a top six winger for sure, maybe a top line winger, right? In Bjorkstrand, and all they got was a third and a fourth round draft pick. I mean. What is the market then for for Yessa Puliarvi or Warren Fogel? So definitely Fogel's negative value. So if they move him, there it will be. I'm going to say a third round draft pick will have to go. Yeah, someone dropped off something. I saw them over your shoulder there, Bruce. Um, third round draft pick is going to have to go the other way, and I'm going to say that's fifty fifty. That trade is fifty fifty. I think. Um, it's a coin flip whether or not that that happens with with the poison pill included. And I like Warren Fogel. Like I, I, I think he's a, a decent hockey player and, and, a, and a hard work and could have a big year where he could score 20 goals. Warren Fogel's the other player who got all these great A shots last year. He and Pugliarvi, it's funny, we're talking about trading them. Meanwhile, Evander Kane was shooting out the lights and we're all overjoyed about him. I mean, I wonder how that's going to bite us in the ass, like bite the orders in the ass. You know, everyone's overjoyed right now that we we... We signed the Oilers signed the player who was on a shooting bender, mm -hmm. and you know we're all like trade the two like everyone's well they're going to trade the two guys who were in shooting droughts. So anyway, that's where the Oilers are. But Fogel could score twenty goals um, if he got hot one year scoring because he gets lots of shots on net, tons of them right in the crease. He just can't drain them. Okay, your odds. Yeah, uh, well, Bjorkstrand, I mean, he's a very interesting case, but at a $5.4 million cap hit for four more years, I mean, that salary drain was significantly more. Yes. And uh, Columbus was trying to bring back uh, Patrick Laine, uh, who they signed for 8.8 .8 or something. There was some huge amount for Laine, so they had to make space for him. And I've heard people say that they actually traded off the better 200-foot player and Bjorkstrand and the one they signed for several million more in line a, but that's the decisions that they made in uh, in Columbus um, but uh, Scott, certainly Seattle got a good player for a very little acquisition cost I mean they still have to pay the guy but they got room to do that uh, Fogel's in a different category uh, but you know I as with Tyson Berry I wrote a, a detailed post about Warren Fogel uh, uh, informed by the salary cap situation that there's a limited number of guys and one of them is going to have to move out as we're discussing here. And I split the, the Oilers uh, projected roster uh, basically in half with the core 12 players being the top two lines, top two defense pair, the goalie and the third line center. Uh, and that group with uh, projected salaries for Pugliarvi and Yamamoto, $3 million each, hauled down $67.5 million of the $82.5 million cap ceiling. So all but $15 million of it is going for, for uh, 12 players. And then guess what? There's another $5 million that's flushed down the toilet for uh, dead cap space, right? Paying for uh, Milan Lucic and James Neal and Andre Sekera and last year's... Uh, uh, performance bonus overages. Add all those up, it's a bit more than five million. Now all of a sudden you've only got ten million left and you still got ten positions on your roster to fill. Well, they always have one of those ten guys who makes more than one and a quarter million dollars. They got veterans like Derek Ryan, Matthias Janmark at one point two five million, and you're standing out like a sore thumb, Warren Fogel at two point seven five million. And he, he's the one that doesn't fit in the roster when you look at it through that lens. Now, he is a pretty good player, and the Oilers have been crying for decent bottom sixers for, what, the last 15 years, it seems like? 
and he is a decent bottom sixer. He delivered as advertised, uh, but the uh, but the cost is uh, is high, and I think they kind of jumped the gun signing him three years at at a significant raise like that. Because I mean, he's he, he's really been a bottom sixer the entire time. There's nothing in his in his uh, resume that suggests he's anything more than a third line winger, which by definition is outside the core twelve, and Nowadays, the way the, the, the salaries are being polarized, and the Oilers are a good example of this, a lot of big money to relatively few players and a whole lot of guys in the NHL minimum through $1 million range at the bottom of the roster. And there's just not a lot of room for uh, for overpays. And uh, to me, Warren Fogel's an overpay. So uh, like the guy, I hope he you know, has, turns around has a little better puck luck next year. Uh, I think they would move him if they could, but uh, as you say, it, it's going to have a not an acquisition cost, but a uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, uh, moving penalty. moving on from him, yeah, acquisition, yeah, yeah, poison penalty. pill, yeah, yeah, and I think that unfortunately would be unavoidable, and uh, I for one am pretty sick of the Oilers having to give up draft choices to. Uh, uh, deal with various scenarios and what's you know, the poison pill for us? Se- hmm? What do you think the poison pill will be? Uh, third rounder probably sounds about sounds about right. Uh, but there's relatively few teams to which they could move him. I guess they could send him to Arizona to be with Zach Cassie. Anaheim. What are the odds do you think that that happens then? Fogel with a third rounder moved. What would you uh, say? I'm going to say uh, 30, 70. 30% chance it happens, 70 that it that doesn't? It, yeah, that he does get moved and 70 oh, st- that he doesn't. Okay, so I, I think it's more likely than you do that that happens. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, okay, let's move on to Pulley Arvey then, because I, I, hmm? I think this might be a little outlandish, but I, I do think that there might have been some persuasion of the Oilers front office from people in Edmonton who are into stats of various kinds, including us, um, mm-hmm. making fairly compelling arguments. Yeah. Because all of the stats, except for some of the counting numbers, work in Yessa Puliyarvi's favor. Everything yeah. except for goals goals and assists. Yeah. So goals and assists, he was at 1.82 per 60 at even strength last year. That ranks him 209th in the NHL mm-hmm. last year. By comparison, uh, Bjorkstrand was at 1.94 and he was at 174th. So Pulley he was he was in a he was in the same category as other NHL forwards as Bo Horvat, Andrej Kasse, A- Anders Lee, um, Jack Eichel, William Carlson, Anthony Sorelli, Lars Eller, Ryan Lombard, Charlie Cole. So these are all kind of okay players. Many of them are pretty good players. So uh, Bjorkstrand's slightly ahead of that. Patrick Liney had a really good year scoring at even strength. He was 29th overall in the NHL at even strength. So that explains why Columbus is really on, you know, just he, he really killed it at even strength this year. Liney did compared to Bjorkstrand. So the thing with Pulley Arvey is the whispering, the whispering campaign. You're like, he wants out, he wants out. Like, um, you know, his teammates don't like playing with them. McDavid and Drysaddle don't like playing with them. You know, so, so that, all of those whispers, Bruce, all of that smoke makes me wonder if there's not some fire there. And if there is fire, if he does want out, then the Oilers should trade him. So I'm going to go with the pulley RV trade, even though I think that the, you know, Brad Hall and clearly the Oilers assistant GM Brad Hall and clearly showed he, he understood the advanced stat argument. He understood the video analysis analysis argument for Pulley Arvey, I think. Um, when he talked about s- advanced stats, he was talking about hand-in-hand hand with video analysis. Right. So I don't, we don't know exactly what they're doing, what services they subscribe to, what what really they believe in, what numbers they put the, a lot of faith into. That's all a mystery to us. But he was at least, Brad Holland was at least very well-versed with the publicly discussed numbers around Pulley Arvey and what some people think they mean. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like he thought they meet, meant those things, you know, that he's that Pulley RV helps the team uh, play better 
when he's on the ice, essentially, that he he helps drive the puck forward and, you know, not get it mired in, in the Oilers' end. So um, I think that I think that maybe they are reconsidering. Maybe they would like to keep him. Maybe they do think, as you and I think, hard to replace a, a winger of that ilk for um, $3 million. And we have a better chance of winning with Yessa Pugliarvi than we do with, let's say, Warren Fogel. We can easily replace Fogel. Uh, what he brought last more easily replaced Fogel and let's and even if it means sucking up a draft pick, um, mm-hmm. you know, losing another draft pick, let's do that because it's all about winning. It's all about winning, and and if that's their thought, I'm 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 good with that. But I'm not sure it is. I'm gonna go since I, I so I'm saying it's fifty fifty with Fogel. I'll say it's a sixty forty. I, do our, our our odds make sense, or should they add up to a hundred? Like the I'm going to make mine add up to a hundred, but you can you do yours. Oh, you're making yours <laughs> add up to a hundred. Yeah, I, I think that you. So what did I say? Uh, I said fifty fifty. One of them's going to go. So I only have thirty percent less left to work with Pulley. So I better make mine add up to a hundred then. I'll say thirty seventy that they move Pulley RV. I, right. I I'm I'll, I because I said it's fifty fifty with Fogel. I do actually think I'm starting to get the feeling that the more likely move is Fogel. That they're going to move Fogel, not play ARV. So um, I'll I'll go with I'll stick with the fifty fifty on Fogel and go with thirty seventy on play ARV, and that adds up to one hundred percent for the who's going to one, get moved. One of the three is is going to move. Yes, exactly. And one of the three. I say so. Fogel most likely, then play ARV, then Barry. Okay. What's your take? All right. Uh yeah. That, well, that that would agree with. With my take, what I think the team's going to do, I, th- I do think it's 50-50 on Pooley Arby, and that might be optimistic. I mean, there's, there's every chance that that this signing could be step one and, and a trade is forthcoming in the coming days. Uh, you know, that's that's one possible outcome. I'm kind of waiting to read the first interview with Yasa coming out of Finland, <laughs> where the truth will out, as it often does. Um, but... Uh, I, again, in this case, uh, wrote a fairly detailed article yesterday after Pugliarvi signed and others before it. But in yesterday's article, I tried to make the case for him both on the uh, uh, analytics side, uh, showing his absolutely fantastic on-ice shot shares where he was the best player on the Oilers if you got, if you just use that and nothing else, uh, which I don't want to do. I also want to do the eye test. Well, I also included this two and a half minute video of Pugliarvi turning over puck after puck that somebody just put together of him making defensive plays in the offensive zone, in the neutral zone, back checking in his own zone, just flat out taking the puck off of guys and getting moving it in the north direction, setting up McDavid on breakaways and a couple of them. And, you know, David, I recognized almost every one of those plays as one where you and I identified that as a positive contribution by Pogliarvi to a grade-A scoring chance that we did throughout the year. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember that play. It was in the neutral zone, and he would never have gotten assist if they scored on that play. But if he didn't make that play, they would never have got the scoring chance at all. And, you know, that that's his strengths are definitely not uh, a sniping and making great passes for tap-ins, his strengths are uh, just being a beast on the forecheck, an octopus. He's all over the puck. He makes it really hard for the other team to uh, uh, to break out cleanly. Uh, he'll either take the puck off or at least disrupt them. And often those pucks create second chances. And this is where the fact that he did play a lot with McDavid uh, actually worked to the order's favor. You know, if the orders are going to get a second chance in the offensive territory with the other teams scrambling, I'd rather that puck is on Connor McDavid's stick than Ryan McLeod or or Warren Fogle. You know, I mean, that's why, to me, Pugliarvi is an automatic top six player because the stuff that he does uh, is beneficial to his line mates. You know, I mean, and it showed up throughout his stats. Every player, every player on the orders had significantly better percentages uh, with playing with Yessa than without him in terms of shot attempts, shots on goal, uh, scoring chances, high danger chances, expected goals. This is from Natural Statric. 
uh, and in actual goals. Like, I mean, all the other stats I mentioned are process stats. Are, are they doing things right to lead to the opportunities? But actual goals are actual goals. And he was on for, I think, 64% uh, goal share, 51 for, 28 against. And I know when he played with uh, McDavid, uh, the duo went 34 for, 15 against. And McDavid, away from Pugliarvi, was 39 for, 35 against. So a slight positive, but he was a huge positive playing with, uh, with Pugliarvi. And if it was just, you know, a couple of players and they clicked or they got some puck luck, that would be one thing. But it's right through the whole team. And it's like these very significant advantages, 5, 10, 15 percent better that players were playing with 13 on their line than not. I mean, I keep that player 10 days out of 10. Whether the Oilers will, and I mean, I'm not in the room. I don't know any of the individual chemistry that's going on. I don't know the history of the, of the, of the you know, the men involved. Uh, but a 24-year-old player who's, you know, still improving and uh, already delivering results like that. And I mean, his, his, I mean, somebody else could say, well, I could make a two and a half video of him whiffing on shots or falling down in the offensive zone. Uh, yeah, you probably could. Uh, you could make a two and a half minute video about just about anything come to that. Yeah. Uh, but, but this one by the uh, excellent Dmitry Fil- Filipovich of uh, the Hockey PDO cast. And uh, he really knows his stuff. I've been listening to that cast and it's good. Uh, anyway, uh, that, it, it's, a, it's a pretty convincing sequence of, of him just dominating around the puck and creating advantageous situations for his teammates you know and the the shot shares argument a lot clearly a lot of people believe it and a lot of people who work in analytics in the nhl believe it and you know the reason i don't put as much weight on it is is simple i think by far Connor mcdavid was the best player on the Oilers. Yeah, not arguing and, and and i find it curious that if Connor mcdavid was the best even strength player on the Oilers, and i don't think it's that close why isn't he the one who's leading the team by a significant? Why doesn't that stat show him significantly ahead of every other player in terms of driving the play, in terms of shot shares, in terms of goal shares? Like if that if the stat really did show two way dominance, mm-hmm. whatever it's supposed to, you know, it would Connor McDavid would lead the way. And the fact that he doesn't lead the way in one year, he finished ninth recently. I just mm-hmm. think like I'm not I don't discount it, but I don't put the weight that other people put in it because Pugliarvi led the team. It just says to me, well, there's something wrong with the stat if Pugliarvi is leading the team. If you're if you're using this stat as a proxy for two-way effectiveness, which it oh. seems to be, McDavid should lead the team. And if it doesn't, you should be asking, how did the, how, what's wrong with this stat? And why am I putting a lot of weight in this stat as opposed to a stat like even strength point scoring? You know, Connor McDavid, way ahead of Yasa Pugliarvi on even strength oh, point scoring, even though Connor McDavid didn't have a great year, even strength point scoring. He was, he was his one of his weaker years at that. But to me, so well, that said, we... there's other forms of analysis. Like when yeah. all of the forms of analysis mesh, mm-hmm. like, you know, we, our form of analysis is based on video review of the player. It's based on kind of a enhanced eye test. You could put it that way. Plus we're trying to counteract each other's biases you know, whatever biases you or I might have by going over each other's work and yeah. trying to come to an agreement on what, what we saw, which is not easy, you know, to watch a hockey game and agree with someone else on what happened on a play. That's we, we often have some pretty good arguments there and some heated debates once in a while, once in a while, <laughs> once in a while we do <laughs> anyway um, with Pooley RV, all of these numbers mesh that we're getting. And I, I suspect all the numbers the Oilers are getting also mesh with mm-hmm. this. They have numbers and we don't know what they are. And this is just, I'm just guessing here, but because our numbers pick up on these things, the on ice numbers that, you know, a huge part of the hockey community puts a lot of weight in. They say the same thing that this is a, this is a good hockey player. So I am thinking the orders are starting to put some weight in it. And that's why I think it'll be Fogel and not pull RV moved out. Uh, uh, Greater likelihood of that. Yeah, well, not in one million years will I tell you that Jesse Pugliarvi is the best player, or was the best player on the 21-22 Oilers, or that he was the best player on his line. Uh, I'm saying he's a wonderful complementary player on a line, and when he's on a line, that line is better. And that includes even Connor McDavid, who is, you know, as good as he is, 
he produced his best results when he lined up with Pugliarvi. When he wound up playing with Yamamoto or uh, a different uh, winger, uh, McDavid's results were depressed a little bit, whereas Pugliarvi would go to another line, and that line would also uh, produce uh, good shares. And, and uh, again, this is just one aspect of the analysis of the game. And uh, clearly, uh, JP's got a lot of work to do on on finishing and some of the you know some of the box car stats, which you know sixth on the team. Well, that's top six, but you'd like to see more. Uh, but when his line is dominating to the point of 34 goals to uh, to 15 with McDavid or 11 to one with Evander Kane uh, on his line, that uh, you know that's that's a chemistry you don't necessarily want to mess with by just trading away the guy because you don't like his contract. I think the on ice shot shares actually, when you look at like the shots for for a forward, tell you a lot about the forward. If a forward's out there and a lot of shots are being generated and, and good shots and goals, usually the forwards are involved in it when they're out there. I I, I find the def- like on the defensive end, the shot share numbers for for wingers especially are, are are random, and and don't say much about the player. So anyway, we don't have to get into this full debate right now. But yeah. first, let's move on to the next topic on the list, which is Philip Broberg. One, one last thing. One last Go thing ahead. on that. Yeah. Uh, just the reason why I'm going with the 20, 30, 50 on uh, those exchanges. Yeah. The impression I got from a distance uh, is uh, Ken Holland is trying to build a team of guys that like each other, get along, or are, are good in, in uh, good in the room. You know, all that all that <laughs> stuff. And, uh, you know, he's gone the opposite of the Peter Shirelli. Let's bring in the guy Connor hates the most on our team and Brandon Manning. And he's, you know, he's got brought in some of his training friends, Warren Fogel being one of them. Uh, you know, Tyson Berry's a popular man in the room. They, you know, they've got this this sort of internal chemistry, and I think he values that to the point that, uh, you know, that maybe changes the odds on on how uh, how he's going about about his business. So it uh, seems like course, it does, right? It seems like it. <laughs> but it seems like it favors Fogel. Like it feels like everything. Like listen, we have our ears to the ground. We're hearing the sportscasters. We're hearing the people who talk to the coaches and the managers off the record all the time, right? Mm-hmm. We listen to them all the time. There is a clear message from the people who all the time talk off the record to Ken Holland and Woodcroft and Tippett. There, the clear message is the players like Warren Fogel. They're not so crazy about yes of Pugliarvi in terms of like one Fogel fits in better than Pugliarvi. Let's put it that way, in the mildest possible way. I don't like. I don't think they dislike the guy. I just think right. it, like Fogel fits in. He's part of this group of the Ontario Mafia, like with mm-hmm. McDavid and his buddies training together. I believe, and so it's just yeah. I think that's a fair comment. Like this is the feeling we get that this and this will be a factor. And and when you said mm-hmm. that, I'm thinking, oh yeah, maybe maybe you're right, and maybe I'm incorrect. Maybe maybe it is going to be Pugliarvi, because that yeah. seems to be the. The unofficial story is that that they're you know both on the ice and a little and off the ice he's just not the right fit for the team and it, and he knows he he believes it they believe it and they're going to trade him. That's the message that all the whispers add up to, and that's probably you got to put some weight in that. I do put weight in it. I'd argue against on the ice, but I think off the ice is is going to be a factor in this. And you know, as you say, they're whispers, and who knows? I mean, we we've seen one or two examples of. McDavid giving Pogliarvi crap on the bench for, uh, you know, not getting the puck in the right spot or going offside or something. There's a couple of plays here and there. We also seen the two of them in a lot of goal celebrations, right? So take out of that what you will. Um, but uh, again, it's just just the feeling I got. You know, they they added Jack Campbell. We saw all these guys in Ontario for Zach Hyman's golf tournament this week, and it's pretty clear that they are very good buddies. And um, I think that Holland is trying to to to, uh, to work from from that uh, from that angle. And I mean, last year uh, it was pointed out right from before training camp when they signed Devon Shore, when they brought in Warren Fogel and and Zach Hyman. Uh, but now a year later, you can look back and say, well, you can't say you can't say it didn't work, right? The team I had a good year and they went far in the playoffs. I think this is um, a valid reason to make player moves, uh, team chemistry. I think it's perfectly reasonable for the GM to think about that, and it's a necessity. And I think Holland's probably pretty good at it after all these years. It's probably something that, that he's come to realize is really important and um, makes a difference on winning and losing teams. Now, it only goes so far. But um, 
this brings us to the Darnell Nurse uh, situation. Dom Lashishan of The Athletic wrote a piece mm. on the 10 worst contracts in the NHL. And he listed at number five, number one, Tyler Sagan is the worst contract. Jeff Skinner is number three. Who's number two? I missed that. Seth Jones. Uh, then we go down. Mark Edward Vlasic. And number five, Darnell Nurse. Darnell Nurse, who starts his eight-year, three, three, $9.3 million per year contract this season, Bruce. We talked about in the past how Darnell Nurse has been a huge bargain for the Oilers, you know, to the tune of two or three or four million dollars a year. We won't go over that again. But I, I just do want to segue from what we were just talking about into why I think, and I have to say this about Dom Lissitian, he's very fair-minded. He, um, he, is, uh, he, he states things very moderately. He's not overly the top um, nasty or aggressive in his commentary. He's, he's, he's a fantastic analyst of NHL hockey. Now he puts a lot of weight in shot share stats, which I, mm -hmm. he puts mo way more than I do. Yep. Um, and he's, he's part of this school. He's a very bright guy uh, doing it. And so his analysis of nurse is based on that kind of statistical evidence. When you look at Nurse's other numbers, like how much the coach plays him on the ice in all situations, overtime, shorthanded, power play, even strength, his points, uh, totals, and all those situations, Dar it's pretty clear Darnell Nurse has been a top 10 defenseman for the, about the last three years in the NHL. And um, so like a number one top 10, like he's a number one D-man on his team, and he's in the top 10 of players for those categories uh, in the NHL with, uh, you know, and every other player on that list is a great defenseman. Now, you could just say, well, Nurse isn't a great defenseman. He just snuck onto that list somehow. But when you're on that list He's year okay after year. player on a terrible team, right? Yeah, you, yeah, you could, you could say that. He's a third pairing guy on any other team. David, on yeah, I don't team. believe that. I think Darnell Nurse belongs on that list and has actually been a number one D-man in the NHL for about, and he's been at, wow. at worst in the top 20 of defensemen, like in terms of real ability. You know, I, I think it, he probably is in the top 10. So he has been, and he's he's going to be as long as he stays healthy for four or five years. I think his best years of his career are heading up. And he's you know 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. He's heading into the best years of his career. He's going to get paid for being a number one D man. He's got every, he's looking like if he's not injured like he was in the playoffs. He, there's every indication he is going to be a number one D man. I, I agree, though, and Lysician's main complaint about Nurse's contract is the final years of it, the final segment, where he just really wonders. Like, he's paid so much, so if he starts playing like a second-pairing D-man, he should get paid about $5 million a year. That's a $4 million gap. That's a huge gap. So that's why Nurse is on this list, because he's paid so much. There's so much riding on his performance that even a slight drop in, like a drop from a top-pairing guy to a second-pairing guy represents a huge overpaid by the Oilers. That's why he's on this list. And Dom Lissitian makes that clear. Bruce, I'm going to argue one that nurse nurse's value and this contract represents m more than on ice stuff. And it's it's part of the play. And it's a big part of the play to keep McDavid and Dreisaitl in town. Nurse being signed up for that long, he's part of the core group of three leaders on this team, the absolute core of this team who's grown up together, been through the wars together. And if you're going to re-sign Dreisaitl and McDavid, this contract with Nurse, I think, was uh, necessary. You had to do it. You had to make this commitment to him. And then you got to do something else. You got to win. You got to win the Stanley Cup in the next two or three years. You got to win the Stanley Cup. If, but you had to also sign Nurse because if Nurse was signed up for three or four years and was going to leave, let's say he was signed up as long, three more years like Dreisaitl was or four more years like McDavid, th the chances of them splitting apart then increase. If he's there and they know he's here, you know that he's going to be doing everything he can every minute of the day to convince him to stay. You know, if your best buddy's doing that, that has an impact, impact on you. And then if you, if you win together, if that comes together and you win, and then you think, well, Darnell's going to be here, and he's and this this is a good team, and because Leon Draisaitl comes next, and Connor McDavid, like you know, we'll see what he does. Like, I just think it increases the odds incrementally, only maybe, of them staying together. But I think it it's it's real. I think maybe it's like five percent more chance that they'll stay together because Nurse signed eight years as opposed to four or three. So that's one of the factors in rating Darnell Nurse's long term contract. 
and because of that, it's one more reason that I'm more inclined to give the contract a thumbs up, which I do. Yeah, well, some might say, well, when it comes time to re-sign uh, dry saddle, that the Oilers won't have enough cap space because they're paying Nurse too much. I mean, that's the kind of the flip side of the argument. Uh, now, Nurse himself was on the wrong side of that equation twice when he got the two two-year bridge contracts that took him right to the cusp of free agency potentially, uh, where both times you know uh, the Oilers ran out of money. I mean, in 2020. Uh, they probably could have got him for eight years at seven million. That would have kept him through, you know, 2028 20, uh, as opposed to 2030. Uh, but Ken Holland put his priorities elsewhere and signed Zach Cassian to a four-year deal in January. And then by the time he got around to signing Nurse, there wasn't enough space to go go deep with him. So Nurse bet on himself, uh, put together two pretty good years. And well, actually, one really good year, and then then he signed the eight-year extension um, when he still had a year to run on his other. As soon as the negotiating window opened, they started negotiating and they got it done. But uh, uh, it so happened that it was in a uh, the bull market, isn't it? For the when things are, it was a bull market for uh, workhorse defensemen that summer, and. Uh, with Seth Jones and Zach Kowinski, who's also on Patrician's list of worst contracts, both getting extensions just before Darnell did. And uh, I've made the case and continue to make it that uh, the Oilers kind of got the shaft when uh, Chicago uh, made that trade for uh, Sean uh, Seth Jones at the draft and immediately announced the eight-year extension that set the new market at $9.5 million for that class of players, when in fact that window wasn't even supposed to be open yet. And the, no, normally the window for negotiating with a player a year in the future opens the day of free agency. You may recall this year on July 13th, day free agency opened, Tampa Bay went out and they signed three guys, uh, Mikhail Ch Sergachev, Eric Chernak, and uh, Anthony Sorelli, eight-year deals, all kicking in in 2023. And the reason they did it all on that day was that was the first day they were allowed to do it. They sort of opened the window on the new uh, sort of fiscal year of hockey. And Chicago announced this eight-year extension for Seth Jones on draft day, which is like a week before. And it reset the market. And then Columbus came in and signed Wierenski. And, of course, they had to pay him at least $1 more than Chicago played paid Jones because it was Columbus who traded Jones to Chicago. So, well, the guy we kept is worth more than that guy. And so now Nurse has got suddenly two comparables. And the base value of that contract went from probably eight to nine plus million dollars. And, you know, it was just a set of circumstances that wound up conspiring against the Oilers uh, just at the time that they were locking them up for the big long-term contract. It really stunk, didn't it? Mm -hmm. That does. Yeah, stink. I, I would have filed a grievance if I was the orders on that announcement of the Jones signing. That that was out of line. Didn't they have every right to do that? I don't know. The league would have ruled against the orders. We know that. <laughs> rule rule one point one point one. So when dry settle <laughs> when dry settle comes up, Bruce, they'll have yeah. forty five million dollars in contracts on the books for that first year of dry settle's new contract. So that's like Campbell. Uh, Campbell, um, Nurse, um, McDavid, Nugent Hopkins, Hyman, Kane, um, Kulak's contract still there. Uh, CC, CC, no, CC's contract is done at the same time as Dry Settles. Um, so that they they will have, um, you know. Hopefully, maybe the cap will go up by then, too. I mean, it's going to take a lot of money to bring back Leon Dreisaitl, obviously, right? Yeah. So, um... Cap will be 90 million by then, I expect. We'll see what happens. I, I, I think equal. if Nurse is still playing like a number one D-man three years from now, it's, that'll be fine. He's, he'll be paid market value. Like, it's it's high at the high end of his market value. He is number one D-man, get $9 million a year in the NHL. That's the market right now. Sometimes it's even more, 10 million. So, um, you know, nurses paid. I don't see it. I'm more like a, I'm more worried about Nuge's contract, honestly. Um, with Nuge's even strength scoring, which has been 
really weak the last couple of years. And, um, you know, if he takes a drop, any kind of drop in his play as he heads into his 30s, he doesn't have a long way to drop from being an even strength scorer to being a, a guy who really can't get it done at even strength, like Kyle Turris all of a sudden. So I'm more worried about the Kyle Turris scenario with Nuge than I am about Nurse's contract not working out. If I'm completely honest, that's my... And Nuge's contract's enough that I'd be thinking, what is going to happen? Like, you know, like, will he have a drop and play at age, you know, 31, 32? What's, or is he going to find a way with his great superior skating and skill to keep playing really strong hockey till he's 35? You can also... I can also see that happening. Like he's not Kyle Turris. He's a much better skater. He's faster. But that's my, I, I'm more worried about Nuge's contract than I am about Nurse's contract. Yeah. And of course he earns a big chunk of that uh, salary on both special teams. Like, he does. You know, and he really, he, he really is a superior penalty. But yeah. on the power play, like, you know, Nuge is a good power player. Evan Bouchard would look pretty good on that spot though, too. And so might, who, you know, Kyler Yamamoto or Yasa or whoever, someone else, like maybe Dylan Holloway. We don't know. Like there's all kinds of people. So Nuge is an, I don't think he's an indispensable power player on the orders. He, he is a great, he has become, I do believe, a great penalty killer, Ryan Nuge and Hopkins. And his defensive play at even strength has also picked up, I think. He had never been strong at center, I don't think, until he moved back there this time. And I thought he was really good at center um, through the playoffs and, when he was moved into that into that position um, this year, so all right, Bruce Philip Broberry, mm. he was not on the list. So Scott Wheeler, who's a ace, who, who also does really good work um, for the Athletic, and he what he what he does is look at prospect players and ranks them heading into each draft, and then as they're young players, he also follows them until they're in, in the NHL, and then he kind of tapers off like his focus is on prospects so he did a prospect list and if you go by these prospect lists in recent years you'd think the orders farm system's not that great evan bouchard for instance evan bouchard never made craig button's top 50 list bruce not once did evan bouchard in all and he was in he was eligible for it at least three years and not mm -hmm. once did evan bouchard who was trending to to be a He's at least top four, maybe a top pairing right shot demon in the NHL. Never made it. So this year, Philip Broberry did not make the top 50 for Scott Wheeler's list. Although Xavier Borgo and Dylan Holloway did right at the end. I think Holloway was 48 and Borgo was 49, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. So, and Scott Wheeler had Broberry as an honorable mention. Yeah. Um, and I'm here to say, I, I don't know if Scott Wheeler's right or wrong. I don't look, I, in terms of ranking the players, yeah. I can't do that. I don't watch all of these players. Yeah. I don't see them play day in, day out. Although mm -hmm. I have seen Dylan Holloway play and Philip Broberry play, and I haven't seen Burgo that much, so I can't say. But my feeling is, and as much as there's a hard feeling against Philip Broberry because he was taken eighth in the draft ahead of Trevor Zegras, Cole Caulfield, and Matthew Boldy, um, I think the orders made, I'm going to still say, and I'm going to still say, I think the orders made the right pick. Mm -hmm. And it's a pick that's trending in the right direction towards Philip Broberry being a top four demon in the NHL. Top four demon are really hard to get. They're really hard to find. And if you think you have the chance to draft one, and you're pretty sure that this player has the tools to be that player, I don't think it's ever a mistake to draft that guy. And as tempting as those other players are, um, well, we saw what happens. <laughs> you know, I don't know if they th were thinking of the Matt Kachuk situation with American players not necessarily being thrilled playing in Canada. Maybe that's a bit of a stretch with those three guys. But my argument really is that Philip Broberry, the Oilers are going to get a win out of that draft pick. Maybe they would have got a bigger win if they had gone in a different direction. But they're going to get, I still think they're going to get a win out of Philip Broberry. He's really trending in the right direction. His skating, Bruce, is his ability to cut off plays in the neutral zone is fantastic because of his size and agility, skating forward, pivoting backwards, and skating backwards. His ability to recover after he's been aggressive on the pinch is outstanding because he's so fast. And to beat, to, to ascend Mount Avalanche 
you will need him. You're going to need this player who can step up in the neutral zone and shut down Nathan McKinnon and, and, and have the speed and the size and the reach to try to make the play. And if you don't, to recover and get him again. Rein him in as he charges into the offensive end as he does. You've got to have that guy. And I think he's going to be the guy. And it's not going to be next this, this year. Maybe the year after he's going to be that guy. And that could be a really, really valuable player for the Edmonton Oilers. I was encouraged by his season in 21-22. He did more at the AHL level than I frankly expected. Uh, I, I mean, I, all along I've been comparing his progress to that of Oscar Kleffbaum, uh, you know, several years previously, uh, being you know, similar uh, in the sense of, you know, those magical words, Swedish defensemen, uh, but also, you know, 6'3", skates like the wind, you know, uh, and possibly good looking, like he's got the whole thing going on there. <laughs> and, that's the truth, yeah. <laughs> These guys are like Greek gods. They like they really are. Like Clef, Clefbaum and Philip Broberry could have been male models easily if they weren't uh, hockey players. Uh-huh. And anyway, he fired up the offense uh, in a manner that Clefbaum never did. And of course, at the NHL level, it was Clefbaum who did become the power play point man and wound up putting up some half decent offensive totals. Uh, but I would say, and it's draft plus three year. Uh, first year in North America in each case that uh, Broberry has uh, stepped a little bit in front of Oscar. Uh, he did play, I think, 23 games at the NHL level. And after being sort of overwhelmed in his first trial, I think he was minus eight and eight games or something. And that was during the time, of course, that uh, uh, all the defensemen were either on the injured or sick list at the same time when they really had to you know, dig deep into the system and there was no way to shelter them all. And he uh, he looked a little overwhelmed that first time. And then with each subsequent recall, I just thought he looked calmer, more effective, a little more uh, 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 aware of his surroundings and uh, secure in his own skin, you know, within those surroundings. I, I, I just like the, the progress that was evident by eye and I think supported largely by uh, stats, certainly by goals for and against stats. He uh, he really stopped the bleeding after that first trial and, and uh I'm confident he's at that stage where he's ready to come into the NHL, probably third pairing, um, but fine. And uh, uh, we'll see. Oscar, in his fourth year, he needed a little tiny bit more time down in uh, Oklahoma City at that time. And then once he came up, he was essentially a uh, a top four. And so I'm not saying Brovery is there yet. On the other hand, I think the Oilers' current top four that they have on the team is much stronger now than it was at that time. So that part of yeah. the comparison is is maybe not entirely valid. Thank goodness they don't have to rush Philip Broberry into the top four like they did with Oscar Clefbaum because they just were mm-hmm. so lacking in NHL defensemen at that time. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. You had to beat out Nikita Nikitin. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark Fain. Uh, Mark Fain was on the right side. Um, yeah, brutal. Just brutal, that those teams. Anyway, um uh what a shame oscar clefbaum uh mm-hmm. isn't still with you edmonton Oilers. such a fantastic hockey player who was really trending up just when he got just when he really got hurt against the ducks i think and uh, mm-hmm. he was he had just taken such a huge step in his game mm-hmm. all right uh but yeah so i i'm i he's on my top 50 list even though i don't know you know 40 of the other players have never seen them play I think he's. I think he's going to be a good hockey player, and and I don't. I don't know if Wheeler's consistently underestimated the Oilers players. Like, um, he was not. Oh, a, I, I don't think. think he, so. I don't think he was a big. Um, he, he I don't think he was a big Bouchard fan. Let me just see if if Wheeler where Wheeler he's had written about Bouchard. Bouchard. He oh wrote no, no, a he had Bouchard. Bouchard. He wrote a series on Lavoie. He wrote stuff on Holloway. Like he actually yeah. has, has has dug drilled deep on uh, on so, a couple of these guys. So, so there's no bias there at all, if, but um, I, I agree. You know, he looks so at he, a lot of players. He thing. had he had Bouchard at um, so the three years that he Bouchard would have been eligible for Buttons list, which is done in in like January to April. Mm-hmm. That's when Buttons list. So there was three years that Bouchard could have made it. Um, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Not one year did did Button have Bouchard. Right. But Wheeler had Bouchard fifth, twelfth. 
and 31st for his top prospects, dropping each year, mm -hmm. but still in the top 50. And so, and I think those are all really reasonable, probably uh, um, evaluations. Button's evaluations, that is not, that was not reasonable for Craig Button to have Bouchard out of the top 50. And you have that, like, why not? Why didn't he? Very idiosyncratic, I guess, would be the, the kindest uh, interpretation. He just saw something in the player suddenly. Because he had Bouchard heading in the draft. Button had him, I think, at eighth or ninth on his list of, like, it wasn't like he hated the player in his draft year. Um, and then all of a sudden he gets drafted by the Oilers and he's off the top 50 list. Like, like he, he's ninth in the draft and then eight, eight months later on the top 50 prospects list, he's nowhere to be seen from Button. Uh, well, I don't get take, it. You can take the man out of Calgary, but you can't take the Calgary out of the man. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I actually like Craig Button and I like that he's got the courage of his convictions to sometimes like, go off of the beaten track and promote or, or depress a certain player that's otherwise, a, 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 you know, there's, there's too much echo chamber in that whole community for my liking that uh, uh, I do, when, when Button sort of says that this guy belongs way higher or way lower, I'll, I'll take at least a look at his rationale behind it. Uh, that said, you know, I'm not, I haven't seen much rationale for from him on uh, Bouchard or Brover. He talks about the guys on his list more than the ones that, that aren't. Uh, for Robbie Threeden. And looking at uh, um, Wheeler's list, I mean, you can say, well, the Oilers are in trouble. They haven't got a single guy in the top 47. Or you could say, well, 50 plus 10 honorable men mentions, I got three in the top 60. We're doing better than a lot of teams with that kind of uh, that kind of depth of prospect. And, and it's just the three most recent first round picks in uh, Robbery, uh, Holloway, and Borgo. And uh, Borgo, I watched him during Memorial Cup, and I, you know, um, in camp last year, I'm pretty impressed with this guy. I think he's got a shot, and the fact that he's a right shooting forward that can play right wing is not going to hurt him on a on a team that's a little shy in in that department. And that said, uh, on uh, Wheeler's accompanying article about goalies, which he did a totally separate article listing the top ten goalies, and he had Jesper Wallstead number one with a bullet which is the guy that the Oilers traded down and took Borgo instead of. So you can bet that that, uh, that name will keep bubbling up on the lips of uh, people that, uh, um, you know, investigate and question the decisions of Oilers management. Such as us. Um, <laughs> part of the so group, right? It is. Uh, Button did have, uh, it's weird, he didn't, he's never rated, he's only rated Philip uh, Brobury once on his top 50 list, mm -hmm. but he had him ninth in 2021. He had him ninth in 2021. And then this year, he didn't have him at all. When And Brobury did better in the HL than he had done in the S. Anyway, I like Craig Button's work a lot too. He's very entertaining. He's a really bright guy. He's, and um, he's an interesting commentator, but uh, his rankings um, confuse me. I will put it that way. Bruce, let's the the final piece of business we're going to talk about is something, um, just a just an, a, a strange thing that that Elliot Friedman reported in 2015. Do you have it on your screen right now? Can you find that story? Yeah, so should, we we've talked can. about team building and we talked about how, you know, how important it is to get the chemistry right. So the orders, and we don't want to make too much of this. This is just more of a a curious. Thought, ancient, curious ancient thought. history, but it's out there. Department. Ancient history, but it's already out there. It's been talked about on Twitter. So some fans are talking about this. So uh, do you, have you found the part in the article? I, yeah, yeah, I certainly do have. Okay, this is so Elliot, go ahead. Elliot Why don't you just, so, so this is the problem between Evander Kane when he was with the Atlanta Thrashers. He was already with the Thrashers. And mm -hmm. the Oilers' new assistant coach that was just hired to be the Oilers' assistant coach, Mark Stewart, who was a player at that time on the Thrashers. So what did Friedman report, Bruce? Okay, Friedman said, following Kane's rookie season, Atlanta made three major trades to improve the team and culture. Uh, after winning the Stanley Cup in 2010, the Chicago Blackhawks faced a massive salary cap crunch uh, and made two separate trades with the Thrashers, Bufflin, Eager, Ladd, Sopel. Seven months later, Boston Bruins dealt Mark Stewart and Blake Wheeler to Georgia where, of course, Kane was a rookie, the franchise that would become the Winnipeg Jets. 
they became the dominant personalities, and I would make the case Blake Wheeler is still a dominant personality in that room. Uh, some think it was for the better, others say it created different issues. Whatever the case, Kane and the newcomers mixed like gunpowder and liquid nitrogen. In retrospect, it's amazing it took this long to boil over. So this was uh, uh, this was a, a feature article on Evander Kane written in uh, February of 2015 uh, that can be quickly found uh, with, a, with a Google search, as we both did, using different criteria. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of background information. Evander needs to do his part and his teammates need to do theirs. In Winnipeg, both have tried that and the conclusion being obviously that didn't work. So we'll see if any of that ancient history gets, uh, I mean, you, you hope that Evander Kane isn't out there on uh, Rodeo Drive saying, holy crap, they brought in Mark Stewart, that guy. You know, I mean, presumably they've, they've done their homework and uh, and uh, uh, fully vetted, you know, past history of anybody that they're bringing on with the players on the team. But it was just kind of kind of eyebrow raising to find this stuff on the internet with the order's newest hire. I mean, they could have hired a whole lot of guys to be an assistant coach. Some guy that has a history of liquid nitrogen and gunpowder, was it? With the Vander Kane wouldn't necessarily be Someone's first choice. On the other hand, it's, he's not Brandon Manning either. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit. That was a little. Uh, like it's it's these kind of disputes rarely get reported. You know, they're like oh. this is this is like being reported, and that's a pretty oh. uh, graphic um, metaphor that Friedman's used there. And um, is that a simile, like gunpowder and mm, yes. simile? Uh, so. What I would hope is that if it hasn't already been done, that the next call is Mark Stewart to Evander Kane. You know, let's clear the air here. If they still have a problem, if they had a problem that wasn't solved, then if they and it's still lingering, um, you know, clear the air, solve that problem. You know, that said, this is a long time ago. They're both different people now. I've, I, you know, I've worked at the Edmonton Journal for. Uh, 37 years, Bruce, Are there we? have been editors that I did not get along with and had mm -hmm. fights, spats with and didn't get along for years. Then we cleared the air. Then we talked it through and we solved problems. And I, from that point on, I would get along with that editor just fine. Like these things can be worked out between people is my point. And yep. you can, you can forge, you just, it's just a matter of sometimes a quick conversation doesn't even have to be that long and there's no problem. So if there is anything lingering if there's any, you know, if the smell of gunpowder and liquid nitrogen is still in the air, talk, talk it through, gentlemen, solve the problem and move on. But that that was kind of like, whoa, that's a little bit. Uh, well, I would suggest that Evander Kane is a very different man now than he was in 2015 or 2011 in, in uh, Atlanta. And there's chances are good that Mark Stewart is also a different man who knows that his new position in the food chain is a lot lower down than it was when he was a... Uh, you know, a regular player and a veteran in the locker locker room, as opposed to being the third uh, assistant coach uh, and the newcomer in a, a, an existing, uh, you know, strong team. So I, I would like to think that they'll be able to, uh, you know, resolve whatever might be left from that without any lingering issues. But it was curious to read this ancient history and say, holy crap, these guys are both going to be in the same dressing room this year. And it's in Edmonton. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, we got the orders. They do the orders. I mean, the other thing Edmonton has is a strong leadership group with McDavid, Dreisaitl and um, and a nurse. And the other thing, the other interesting thing I saw was the uh, Andrew Ferentz's thing. He wrote this tweet thread about um, when when he was captain of the team and the rookies were in, they, I think it was when they were out in Jasper that same time and Settle was there. Mm -hmm. And um, Ferentz has a friend who was in the military, ex-military, oh, right. took him out to the bush. Mm -hmm. And for it was like a couple of days, I think, that they were just kind of basically living off the land and having to work together. And Ferentz wanted to see them, like his teammates as people, these young young guys as people. Like, you know, who's going to be the guy who complains about the dry salmon in the in the uh, food line? You know, mm -hmm. the, the first world problem of that. And who's going to be the guy who's uncomplaining, 
looks to solve problems, is very resourceful, and gets the job done. Um, and the, the player he singled out as having mm -hmm. a great attitude and leadership ability was Leon Dreisaitl, which mm -hmm. I found really heartening because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's criticism of Dreisaitl. Um, you know, his, his body language and, and, you know, so, and I will criticize his defensive play now and then, as you well know. Um, so it was just extremely heartening to hear that someone as solid and smart as Andrew Ference has had a high opinion of him at that time. And I, I found that great. That was fantastic to read. And I, I thank, thanks to Andrew for sharing that anecdote with, with Edmontonians, because there, there are people who question dry settle, and I know that bothers you that, that some people really question his work ethic and stuff like that, which I don't do. I think he's a very hardworking player. The odd bad line change <laughs> accepted. <laughs> but, you know, he's tired when he comes up. It's the NHL and ice time by a forward. Poor yeah. Worker. Poor worker. Uh, it just yeah. doesn't mesh. Yeah. Sorry. He's a beast. He is a beast. And having spent time at the Oilers training camp, uh, watching Leon spend 20 minutes at, after basically the end of practice when most of the other guys were going off, lining up in the right circle, taking pass after pass from a coach across the ice, behind him, in front of him, hard pass, soft pass, in his feet, right on his stay, just snap, 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 one shot after another at the net. Gave me some real insight in how this guy went from being a 30-goal scorer in junior to a 50-goal scorer in the National Hockey League. And that is not poor work ethic. It's not the stuff we normally see on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, it's the stuff that uh, that sometimes separates the truly elite from, you know, the merely good to great. And well, how does a player, how do you, how does any human being get to pass the puck on his backhand like Leon Dreisaitl can do it? It's obviously through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of pass of working on that one skill mm -hmm. again and again and again until it is it is just automatic until he doesn't think about it he doesn't he does it just it, it is automatic and he can he with confidence he can snap off that backhand pass like nobody else in the nhl and yeah he's got a good work ethic i'm guessing all right bruce any other thoughts? Do you want to leave it there? Or any covered the covered the territory? We covered the territory. Next up, Yamamoto and McLeod getting done, and then we'll I'd see some kind of resolution of the salary thing. But uh, that could take anywhere from a week to two months. So maybe Indeed. next podcast we'll have it all covered, and uh, maybe we won't. Yeah, there's talk of a few more signings. We'll see. All right, Bruce. Thanks for talking today. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.